thank you so much uh, for inviting me here. I'm really honored uh, to have this much space to talk about some of my own research and, of course, uh, a lot of happenings that are, I have not been personally involved in. Uh, please let me know in the chat or by shouting if you can't hear me or if there's something else funny going on with my stream here. Uh, so I'll try to use my 40 minutes wisely to give you a short review of the connection between cost and open access and trying to look at the different uh, main models that we have around us today and see how they're evolving. First, I'd like to highlight that open is a good thing, like making things open is great, but it shouldn't come at just any cost. So, and I'm not only talking about uh, money, but also other things that relate to uh, ob obstacles that are created. Let's see. So, yes, equality of participation and, and having a well-functioning scholarly communication system are just some of the important things I need to I think we need to think about when we design and fund different types of mechanisms for making open access and just open science in general, that money is one thing uh, and money is connected to many other uh, more immaterial things about how well we can just communicate the different findings and have a dialogue in research. I wasn't prepared for such a good uh, a review of my background, so we can almost skip this, but I could highlight that um, I'm also uh, a board member of the Finnish Association of Scholarly Publishers, so uh, I'm more and more involved in thinking about national journals and, and scholar run journals and uh, thinking about how they could be funded in the future, since many are still not open access in that regard. But yes, I research open access and open science, and I'm also trying to be as active as possible in different working groups and in advocacy for, for, for open access. And I could mention here that though I'm very much pro-open, some of my presentation here and some of the things I just say in general aren't always what you want to hear. So I'm, I'm not trying to be overly negative, but I'm trying to be realistic also about uh, the ways we spend our money and time in order to advance openness. So even though any, any open additional openness is good, um, it's, uh, the, I, as a researcher, I'm always trying to dig a bit deeper and see how we can uh, evolve things even further. So no slant against openness in that regard. And I have kind of a three point agenda here. I don't maybe have these as separate talking points, but these are the main three things I want you to remember at least that open access by itself is not the solution. So we need to think about how we provide open access in order to make it affordable, cost-effective, inclusive, and uh, sustainable in any way. So by itself, open access isn't the key. And the three different models I tried to cram into this uh, in my view, short speech, but of course I have a luxurious amount of time here. Uh, so three, three different models, transformative agreements, full open access journals and green open access. And the third thing I'd like you to remember is that how we spend our money, even though it's trickled down through different pockets in the chain, that is ultimately how our science policy gets implemented in how we spend those small and big streams of money. So even though we can say nice things in policy documents and in uh, what are these celebratory speeches in different uh, ways, it really comes down to how we spend our money in how we support different options and how they, how they continue to evolve. This is a, a line of thinking uh, I borrowed from my doctoral thesis where I looked at the development of open access and I think it's still relevant. Most of that thesis isn't that relevant anymore since open access uh, evolves at quite a pace. But I really think splitting or trying to even split open access into some analytical dimensions is important. Um, it's driven by a need for better scholarly communications. We have better and better technologies to support low cost open access. But in these later years of, of open access or wherever we are, uh, some kind of a midlife of open access development here, uh, 
uh, these financial aspects and science policy, I think, have become really accentuated in how they try to drive and shape um, based on based on different agendas how how these forms of open access develop. So I think this is a good way to kind of open up here that simply talking about financial aspects is not enough. We need to think about how things are interconnected and uh, how different things are shaping. And this is, of course, a very strong simplification. Uh, this is a slide I borrowed here from, from some other uh, Finnish authors. Oh, the year is long into the future. It's published this year in 2021. This is, I guess, the most recent snapshot about how open access is developing in, in Finland. And here we can see that uh, open access publication channels, so uh, full open access journals, are constantly growing, the articles published in them. Then we have open access in other channels, which is mostly attributed to hybrid open access. That's also been growing at quite a pace if we look just for four years back, where it was a kind of a minuscule uh, share, but through transformative agreements and just hybrid open access in general, this has been growing quite a lot. And then the extra that's provided as unique green open access that isn't available in any other um, any other uh, way uh, has been kind of stagnating lately. It hasn't been growing as fast as the other forms. So this is something we can take to the back of our heads and try to remember as we go further into thinking about costs and, and these different mechanisms that it's constantly growing and has been jumping quite a lot from 2016 to to now 2020, where we have like a, a, over a doubling of the amount of or the share of open access we have available of everything that's published. So it's quite a leap, but the different mechanisms have also shifted quite a lot. And I'd like to put, us to put on like a pair of glasses for, for today. One of those is thinking about bibliometrics. So about um, how researchers think about publication channels, how libraries think about public publication channels. But then we also need like a second lens of our dysfunctional pair of glasses here, which have mispaired lenses, but we kind of need to see both uh, sides of this um, story here to think about just the pure economics of what it takes to run and maintain services. But we also need to be knowledgeable about the kind of the, the, the metrics part and the whole context of journal publishing. So we don't get too, uh, too deep into just thinking about minimizing and, and maximizing different costs and um, in order to run, run services. But we are in an existing environment where we need to take different uh, things into account. So we can't just talk pure money or just pure uh, information science. We need to have a bit of both here. So how does openness and money mix? And that's been a, a big question ever since, I guess, open access started in how to both shift to open access and how to keep it running uh, in a cost-effective way, since there is potential to cut down on the total expenditure that's paid for, for publications, if everything else would stay the same, volume-wise volume and so forth. Um, and basically, more transparency into all of this would be beneficial, in my view. And of course, everything I'm saying now is my view, so I won't <laughs> talk about every bullet point that's coming, uh, coming from me, because I, I think it's understood here that, in my view, at least, more transparency wouldn't harm anyone else than those that have something to hide or um, put a, a veil on where that actual money is going. So I think most actors would really benefit from more transparency. And that's also, of course, something that Plan S is trying to help with to uh, make publishers and journals make more of their costs available to the public. But of course, of course, just knowing how much it hurts and, and where that money goes isn't helping that much. We need to also figure out how we can then try to make that into a, some kind of competitive or uh, environment where it's not just business as usual, but with added transparency. But we need to see that the knowledge about these different costs would also have some influence on, on the price. And I'd like you to think, because this is, I think, one of the central nuts to crack when it comes to all of this is thinking both short-term and long-term. Since we can't pause or reboot 
the scholarly publication environment, it needs to be kept running all the time. So how would we best use our pile of money that we have for this year to facilitate more open access sustainably and, and in, in a way that makes the next decision we have to make next year and in the next three years somehow easier or, or, or more in line with what we want the overall landscape to be. And then, of course, we need to think about how we want it to look in 10 years, like how we use money today shapes how things will be in 10 years. But at the same time, we can't compromise too much uh, of the current activities. So this balancing between short term and long term is, I think, one of the key questions when it comes to aligning more money to open infrastructures to kind of get everyone thinking more long term and not just uh, getting through the year. Uh, maximizing open access in any way possible. So is open less expensive? Now that open access is rising, are libraries swimming in money that they don't know what to spend? I think the, the answer is uh, a negatory, that that's so far not the case. Uh, and even though there's a lot of journals and most of the journals in the directory of open access journals are free to publish in, most of the, the articles that are published are in journals that ask for a fee. And we are still paying for subscriptions in order to just read up materials that still get published in subscription journals and also for all old materials. And there's been kind of a persistent lack of one or some kind of universally applicable, scalable models that would be as easy as getting an invoice from an international publisher to solve our dilemmas. And that has led to scarce resources being spread too thin. So, of course, publishers can offer these models, but they come at a, at a price in many ways. And some of the biggest publishers don't have a lot of full open access journals, if you look at their full share. So among these five biggest publishers that I've uh, used here, only a fifth of their journals are full open access journals. So they're not really panicking and, and may flipping all their journals to, 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 to cost-effective models, but, but rather delaying that, that flip to perhaps, I, don't, I wouldn't say never, but it's not happening soon. And the problem or an interesting aspect here that these publishers are both dominating when it comes to the publication output that they produce, that uh, according to this, um, uh, survey by the European Universities Association, uh, over 50% of the publications that uh, uh, libraries subscribe to are from big publishers, but even more so, this material eats up of library budgets uh, of around 75%. So there's less and very little to go around for supporting alternative models if budgets stay the same and if we stay as committed to these publishers. So just as a bit of context here. And one of the fun things about open access is that it's all just a big puzzle of, of trying to think about different incentives, both short and long term, thinking nationally, internationally, thinking about individual actors and autonomous actors such as researchers, uh, how universities want to stay competitive. And um, yeah, it's very complicated. And this is all a big puzzle that I think is very relevant for thinking about how to shape uh, the future of open access, but there still is a lack of kind of a unified view or, or some models that would really be applicable to everyone and, and that everyone could subscribe to. So, sorry for the pun, but, but in the sense that um, there's, there's dif different interests and, and the scale of planning is also different for all of these levels of, of happening. So it's all very challenging and uh, we won't dig much into it now, but, but it's very also siloed in a way that everyone has kind of their own thing going and there could be a more collaboration to make things happen. And as was mentioned earlier today, Finland has its buns well in the oven or however that, that idiom translates, but in the sense that we have things fairly well when it comes to a national strategy uh, and policy for making publications open access. It takes into account a lot of different things that are relevant that haven't always been part of these national policies where they have appeared. 
So we have negotiation strategies or, or, or goals for these international publishers, and we have um, considerations for national publishing. But these policies can't be too far out, out of line from what is the realities today. And that's the problem with these policies, that they have to be forward looking, but not forward pushing in a sense that researchers shouldn't feel alienated or, or threatened by policies that do not feel uh, that they help them, their careers or uh, make or that are helpful for their research. So there's always this tug of war between short and long term thinking when it comes to shaping how we want open access to develop. Before we dig into these models, I think one important differentiation is simplifying things again into uh, public domain clip art here, thinking about funding open access from the front end, like as end customers, where we mainly pay for services that are delivered largely by someone else. We are not owning anything, we are not having any governance over the organization, or we are not kind of part of it other than paying a bill. But then there's the other, Aaron, again, a caricature or another extreme where we fund and own part of the factory or the services or uh, are somehow have agency in, in, uh, in the organization or, or the technical infrastructure or whatever it might be. This will go into practical examples, but I think this differentiation is important to think about when we uh, consider different models. So far, there's been quite a frenzy for this uh, shopping cart model where we pay for someone else to provide open access for us uh, with kind of an easy solution. It's of course nice to go to the supermarket there. They, the stocks are all, the shelves are always stocked. Uh, items are priced, uh, well, if not competitively, at least uh, they are priced. So you know what you're paying for at least in comparison to being an owner where it's much more of a question mark what you might be getting in the future. And uh, even though this kind of paying for APCs or transformative agreements or hybrid open access, as I've taken as the examples here, they solve immediate problems for some and delay taking a harder stance at alternative models. So they are, in a way, they are, they are fast. You, you can get open access immediately. For example, in the case of Finland, through transformative agreements, we've been able to boost the national open access quite a lot. So it works. By paying for what we get, we can get more open access. But are they cheap? Mm, I would say no, again. My, my opinion here, they aren't cheap because you aren't able to negotiate for a lower price when you're asking for more. And do you have any steering wheel on this shopping cart? I, I, I would argue no. You aren't in any way in a strong, position to argue for the direction of where things are going or what the longer roadmap for, for example, transformative agreements are or the development of APC pricing in journals. So you're kind of buying convenience. And that's nice in a way, but I wouldn't say it's an optimal solution. And the problem is, of course, they stem long back before even open access in how the market or whatever we call this landscape of journals and their competitiveness, how it's been shaped since, I guess, the cereals crisis and even before, in that uh, pricing is not transparent, you aren't able to really compete for access to journals, and, and nowadays for publishing in specific journals. They are individual products. Uh, transformative agreements stem from historical spending, so they're not really grounded in any reality, rather just taken from what was once paid for uh, and just a lot of percentages on top. Then it's all very distributed, both internationally and also in the sense that the primary end customer, both for subscriptions and for APCs, is kind of disconnected from the actual payer, be it the research funder or the library, that the decision to publish somewhere is always made by the researcher, I hope, uh, but they are usually not the ones who actually foot the bill, and that's good, but it makes things hard to kind of have a natural competitiveness for, for cheaper publishing. But this is probably a lot of just old hat for, for most of you that things are messed up and aren't really getting any less untangled soon. And we shouldn't make 
like commercial publicly listed companies are friends. Though you should keep your enemies close, I don't think you should have them be your main service provider for your infrastructure because uh, they are out to seek profits and seek growth uh, for any price. Like that's their ultimate goal. And that's why people invest in their stock and hire people to, to run, run these companies. So they can either raise prices or expand their business to other sectors of, of the landscape or somewhere else, but they need to show consistent growth. So having a race to the bottom in terms of pricing and counting on that happening with commercial actors when we are as entangled and entrenched by these companies, it's not going to happen. So I, I would reconsider such strategies. But more specifically about transformative agreements, I think um, consortias are a great thing, that this is one of the good things that has come out of uh, open access in that there's been this banding together both nationally and internationally in getting purchasing power and negotiation power pooled together and having strategies. I might not always agree with uh, the decisions that are ultimately made and, and uh, the models that are supported so strongly at the cost of other options, but this is good. It's good to have muscle behind these things so things aren't too distributed. So this is a great thing. Here I borrow quite wordy bullet points here from a recent article published on transformative agreements where these Spanish researchers tried to categorize publicly available agreement texts into kind of di different ways. And they could see kind of an evolution that, that first these start with being pre-transformative so that customers get discounts and vouchers for a number of OA articles in addition to subscriptions. Uh, some more mature or evolved uh, agreements tr try to separate a reading fee and a published fee, even though the number just keeps on increasing, doesn't matter, they try to separate these for the future. That's, I guess, a good thing for transparency at least. And then there are these all-inclusive deals, the fully transformative agreements that even Finland has a number of uh, allowing seemingly unlimited publication or, or, or scaled to the maximum output of the, the estimated output of the country. And some of these, uh, I think most of them revolve around hybrid open access publishing, but even some also allow away journal publishing. And what I think is good that these Spanish researchers um, try to look at how transformative are these really for, for changing the landscape. And they could see that they are better, these, these agreements, in that they are at least more transparent than we used to have. But, but that's not maybe that's going from horrible to slightly less horrible in sense of transparency and decoupling of different services and, and purchasing. But um, what I think is uh, concerning is that they also see that there's been a shift from driving price down or affordability down to just maximizing OA publishing. Of course, this can be part of the same negotiation, but it's hard, of course, when you ask for more with, I guess, then less, because no one would accept less of these companies. I wouldn't. So, so uh, if, I, if my job would be to see a 5% increase year on year in money that comes in, I wouldn't accept any less from a negotiating party. And they also see uh, as hard, uh, hard, uh, hard to envision that these would not just be a temporary uh, phase uh, or, or like that, that are these transformative. They can't really see a strong movement that these would really unlock complete cost affordable true competitiveness in the scholarly publishing market. But I recommend looking up this recent article in, in Learned Publishing if it's something new to you and seems of interest. So are we just uh, winning small battles at the cost of losing well, a war. I know I'm really driving things to a, to a kind of a climax here with these uh, analogies, but, but the whole thing started, at least in Europe, with kind of a hard, taking a hard stance on avoiding double dipping for publishers to say that we're not going to pay both hybrid open access fees and subscription fees, and we want them all bundled into one. And I guess that's good. But when that bundle becomes like huge and increasingly expensive over time, are we winning? Uh, is this what we want? 
and we are even further entrenched by these publishers, of course, when researchers then get incentivized to publish in them and uh, yeah, and they rise in the ranks of scholars as well. So it's even harder to say no to different types of deals in the future. Okay, enough of that gif loop. Um, and the last slide regarding transformative agreements revolves around what it would cost in a full open access future if, for example, Elsevier would flip all of their journals today and remain as lucratively profitable uh, and having the same kind of financial stats at the end of the year, but they would get no subscription revenue. And there was this recent publication in the journal Publications that calculated this roughly and came to the amount of around $4,000 would be the current article processing charge if we divide the publication output of Elsevier to what they're making. So while this could be like a hurrah for some, I don't know if we should kind of start the party just yet, because that's quite a large barrier of entry to get to pay to play in this system. So um, I think we need to reconsider. Then I know I'm pressed for time here. I try to speed it up a bit in order to get through all of this, since I think we're, we're uh, reaching kind of the meat and potatoes of what I, what I actually want to say about what could be some solutions to all of this. Uh, when it comes to full open access journals, in the past, I was kind of not negligent, but I didn't make such a large differentiation between APC based or APC supported and these no fee journals. But the older I got, and maybe my brain is still then developing or, or something, but I've gotten a much stronger appreciation for the dynamics involved in no fee open access journals. And here I've tried to visualize it prettily as a different planets of a solar system, even that they have their own uh, wood based uh, climate here on the APC uh, journals and some kind of glittery stuff happening on the non APC. A camp, but but I would say that their circumstances are so different in what what they need to to be supported that they really need to be harder differentiation between these. I think both in my presentation and also in how we think about them going forward, because it all has to do with the shopping cart factory clip art analogy, that usually with APC journals like these, uh, we are paying for an outsourced service that we have no control over. And also, again, a paper by Spanish researchers, which have been really hot into these, these topics lately, they could see that there is this kind of almost explosions of new journals being created and kind of raise some doubt about if this is really what kind of the scholar, does the scholarly landscape need more APC journals or more journals in general? And are, are these always shaped by the demand of scholarly communications or are they just, uh, yeah, created for business purposes? But who are we to say? We'll see how it plays out, but there is this kind of tendency happening. And our big friends at these uh, big international commercial publishers are, are, are very open-handedly, uh, have been buying for a, for a number of years rising open access publishers. So rather than converting their own journals at a hasty pace, they buy up portfolios of open access journals, which is kind of a risk-free endeavor. That again, has to do with market expansion, uh, trying to get more money in the future by, by owning larger parts of the landscape based on different models. And this keeps happening. I really like that the ISSN has this service for monitoring journal transfers uh, between publishers. And quite often it happens that journals go from smaller to larger publishers to kind of, so that the market just keeps snowballing however we see it. But I really recommend this underrated service if you haven't had a look at it yet. This is an old slide and a limited slide, but the main point is that APC costs in these commercially ran open access journals have been increasing and they've been increasing quite a lot since th these figures were created, but I couldn't find any fresher ones for this presentation. But, but the main point is that we have no control over what the price will be once the free lunches are over in these uh, journals that were started quite inexpensively or even free for authors, but might be very expensive in the future as they become preferred outlets for 
different authors as they get indexed and uh, get, get uh, ranked more highly in the scholarly ranking system. So we shouldn't think that open access journals, even though they are APC based, will always be as cheap as they are today, since this is just like the growth phase of these different companies before they maybe get then ac acquired by a larger player at some point when they become like Hindavi in this, for example, has already been. Uh, Vanessa already highlighted this, and this is one of the greatest reports I've read recently about diamond open access, so journals that are free to publish in. And I think this report comes with many good news in that uh, uh, there's a lot more of these journals that, than, than are currently indexed in the directory of open access journals, so there's still a lot to discover and uh, keep better tabs on. But there was also something concerning in that the, the authors, where Vanessa is also part of, um, is, uh, could see a reduction of, in publishing in these open access, uh, diamond open access journals, perhaps as uh, connected to an increase in publishing in APC-based journals. Okay, correlation and causation are hard to prove, but I can also get like a, a stomach feeling, whatever, how you transfer that. My intuition would also say that these are somehow connected. Uh, and it's ha glad, I'm glad to see that the diamond sector of these journals is very diverse. We also have many of them here in Finland. And these are all fairly low cost operations with 70% of the surveyed journals running on less than $10,000 euros in annual costs. So we could maybe bet on this horse a bit more and try to expand a more fruitful environment for making these journals stronger, more visible, Techni technically proficient. Um, that also goes for university presses, which, all, which also host, of course, diamond open access journals, but also, of course, monographs and other publication types. But these are some of the good things and these factory type ideas that the scholarly community or, or the journal outlets or publication outlets have some connection to kind of the scholarly community, be it a university or, or a society that runs it itself or something like this, where there's more to say about how things are ran. And maybe the best thing about open access so far uh, is are these journal portals that make things really easy for journals to set up, maintain, get really modern technical support for their journals, because otherwise it's really hard for small scale journals to keep up with software updates and uh, preservation uh, services and all, all of this that goes into running a journal. So I think this is a horse that needs to be bet on even more to see that we uh, give these journals the resources they need and, and expand, of course, to could be discipline specific portals and um, stuff like this. And then finally, I don't have a lot of slides about green open access since it doesn't really involve money directly. Most of it is indirectly. But it is currently the most popular way to prov provide open access if you look at different measurements globally. So green open access is still kind of the main unlocker of, of science in a sense. And it's of course very useful, but the problem has maybe always been that it's not really a game changer. It's not systemic, it's not comprehensive, it's not, and it's also very distributed in a sense that it, for long it was on the, the authors to do something. Now the libraries have gotten more involved, but it's not systemic. And it's still, it's uh, distributed in a sense that it's hard to make it 100%, of course, due to publisher policies, but also just due to it being, being a manual process largely, largely. And there's been this sign of plateauing in some many countries, some or many I mentioned here, <laughs> um, where there was strong growth previously. So have we maybe reached the top of what green open access can give under the current circumstances? Question mark. Uh, and how will publishers react? They always react to anything, but how will they react to, to both more green open access growth, for example, through Plan S and re rights retention strategies and so forth. And also with these transformative agreements becoming the norm, if they can sell it, why would they make it easier for you to get it for free? I wouldn't, if I would be a publisher. So that is um, uh, driving for profit. And how long does, does the scholarly community want to accept the drawbacks of this when it comes to licensing, machine readability, and often months or years of delays in getting results out to the public? Question mark. 
And I really like this uh, new, well, newish dashboard provided by the Cookie Project, um, where where they look at uh, articles with DOIs and with which mechanisms they're available open access. You can filter by country, and here I selected the United Kingdom, since they were really early on with funding hybrid open access and putting money behind open access uh, availability. And here we can also see that, of course. The most recent year we shouldn't pay too much attention to because there's always a lag in data being recorded and particularly green open access really profilating from different repositories. But even just looking back to 2018-17, it's kind of plateauing when it comes to green open access, while hybrid and gold open access are on the rise. So we should maybe see that we're not exchanging green open access for really expensive options when it comes to um, uh, enabling open access in directly in journals and try to also have smart science policy behind this. My last two slides, trying to make it in time. This was a good tweet, at least it got me thinking uh, of Spark that lamented the purchasing of Hindavi uh, uh, by Wiley, where Leslie Chan, who's always comes with good ideas and is really a good thinker in this space, uh, kind of argumented that maybe we shouldn't think of it as a uh, that, that the market ha is driven just by competition and, and, uh, and being as a market. Maybe we should have different values and different kind of goals rather than having many competitors in the marketplace driving the price down. That maybe we need to think of it differently and use our shopping cart for something else than just trying to find the, the cheapest, cheapest list price for whatever it, we're looking at. So maybe it could be more Commons and and uh, and uh, inclusively driven, so that that we have entirely different models uh, in the future than those that are currently offered by our our big players. This image was added by me. Leslie wouldn't probably uh, stoop so low to use semi funny images to support his messages. Uh, but these are my key takeaways. I think science policy should not just be short term. Like even though some models solve problems immediately, we should have this long-term thinking. And there, of course, national strategies help in pinning down what we want to have in 5, 10, 15 years, rather than solving the next quarter or saving the library budget for, for the next year. Uh, and the problem is that the large commercial publishers are, are have long been the ones that are truly international in pooling money, in pooling uh, resources, pooling Every, everything, and we need to be better at making collective action happen also in the scholarly, scholar-run space, so to say. And funds should be directed, as Vanessa's talk also touched upon, to infrastructures, models, and platforms. Uh, we can fund the journals individually, that's of course also needed, but we should also have money left for infrastructures that actually make a change. And if we want the, the future to be inclusive and, and have an equitable space, we need to lessen the reliance on these a few big publishers so that they aren't shaping the market for us and the pricing for us. And so far, green open access has been a great low cost option, probably continues to be so, but what now? Like for the countries that are betting hard on it, will we now be paying increasingly just for gold open access and at the market rate? question mark. But that's all for me. I'll, I'm glad to take questions if we if we have time. Thank you for your attention.